the tragedy that should have never happened here in the United States of America, the denial of something as basic as clean, safe drinking water. In April 2014, residents across Flint, Michigan turned on their faucets to find that the water had turned brown and was giving off a foul-smelling odor. Complaints began flooding the city's government offices, with fears of contaminated water growing as the days passed without improvement. The local government asserted that it was safe, despite the residents' concerns of contamination. Initial testing determined that Flint's water met all safety standards and, despite increasing complaints from the city's residents, no action was taken. It wasn't until early 2015, almost a year after the initial reports of contaminated water, that the city was compelled by Leanne Walters, a Flint resident and mother of four, to test the water for lead after her children broke out in rashes. The test would reveal dangerously high levels of lead in Flint's tap water. But how was Flint's water contaminated with lead in the first place? To trace the origins of Flint's water crisis, we have to follow the pipes. In the 1800s, lead was an attractive material for water pipes due to its malleability and durability. The health risks, however, were cause for concern, and by 1920, local governments limited or prohibited the use of lead pipes despite their efficiency benefits. Despite a congressional ban on their use in 1986, as many as 10 million lead pipes are still transporting water in American cities like Flint. The use of lead pipes in Flint, however, posed little threat to the community until 2014, when the city decided to switch Flint's water supply from the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, or the DWSD, to the Carignandi Water Authority, or KWA, in an effort to save a projected $200 million over 25 years. The wait to construct Flint's new pipeline connecting it to the KWA, however, would necessitate an interim water source, the Flint River. On April 25, 2014, Flint River water began flowing out of the city's faucets. Resident complaints about the water's color and odor came within a month. Flint's history, however, extends beyond just lead pipes. The city's population is 50% African American, the per capita income is less than half that of the rest of Michigan, and the poverty rate is 40.1%, the highest in the state. The demographics are essential in understanding the social and political effects of the water crisis, and may explain the decisions made by city and state authorities. The first response, of course, was to wait and see if any problems turned up. In April 2014, then-Mayor Dane Walling cheered to Flint and drank water from the Flint River before cutting the city off from the DWSD, a public show of faith in the water's quality. It would be only days before complaints came in about the new water. In August, the water was found to contain elevated levels of E. coli and related bacteria, prompting the city to increase chlorine levels in the water. The water problems were made apparent in October when General Motors stopped using Flint water in its factories after discovering it was corroding metals. This allowed lead from the Flint pipes to contaminate the water supply. In February, tests found that Flint's water contained more than double the EPA's safety limit of lead. It was later found that the Flint treatment plant had not implemented anti-corrosion methods, violating the federal lead and copper rule. The consumption of water with such high lead levels poses great health risks. A study published by Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha found that blood lead levels in children under 5 had increased from 2.4% to 4.9%, a statistically significant increase, which was most prevalent in socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods. The city government initially told citizens to relax. Later in August, the MDEQ dropped two samples from its report on lead levels, putting the results within federal regulations despite very clear indications that the water was too dangerous to use. These cover-ups and inefficiencies demonstrate how uncaring the local government truly was. The system of emergency managers that governs Flint's reaction to public crises is structured to prevent accountability of officials and input of residents. This system is maintained by Governor Rick Snyder, who also appoints the emergency managers. The actions of Governor Snyder and the emergency managers, like Darnell Early, were deliberate and conscious. They knew that moving to the KWA and using the Flint River responsibly would be too large a financial project, choosing instead to forego the additional costs at the expense of the city's poor and minority populations. Thus, the Flint water crisis was also the result of structural and strategic racism. Today, the water in Flint is still unsafe. Though steps have been taken to reflect the magnitude of the crisis, such as the declaration of a federal state of emergency and the return to allegedly safe Detroit water, Flint residents are calling for accountability. Despite the tragedy of the situation, one thing is certain. The voices of Flint citizens will not be silenced. What do we want? We want we want Governor Snyder's address will have to compete with this. Please come to get you, Snyder. Tony Pellet.